In today's episode, we'll discuss what some might consider the juicy stuff. Mysticism. Sorcery. Magic. Using names to affect supernatural things. Hmm. So, obviously, we're not going to be giving practical instructions. We're going to be discussing these things conceptually. But it's interesting nonetheless, and it's important to know. So, section 3, chapter 2. Regarding using names, divine names, and sorcery. Number one. This number one over here is going to be a general recap of a lot of concepts that we've covered throughout earlier chapters of the book. So we've already explained in depth that the beginning of any creation originates in the primordial forces up in the heavens. That are clearly arranged up in the supernal realms. And from there, they channel one stage to the next down levels until it reaches into the physical world. Sounds familiar? Right, it should. Odbeanu, we also explained. Inyan Koichas Hara, the concept of evil forces. Shemehem Mishtal Shalom Haroz Kulam Bagashmim, that from those root forces of conceptual evil in the heavens, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this episode, that from there, that generates what we perceive as evil here in this world. We've also explained the main element, the essence of anything that exists is not here, contrary to what we might assume because our perception is limited to the physical world. That is the source of where we interact with things. And so therefore we tend to relate to the physical world as real and the essence of something and the fact that there might be some sort of spiritual source to it is theoretical. And, uh, and it, you might have to believe in it. But the truth is, it's the opposite. That the essence of reality is in the spiritual world. And what manifests here in the physical world is nothing more than a projection. We're only here because God believes in us. <laughs> That's a good line. who hemshech levad and anything that exists here in the physical world is only a projection of what has been rooted and founded up in the spiritual world. Ve'ulam, furthermore, Shom nistar v'nispashit mash hoyo roi lehispashit l'fi amitas ha-metzios ha-nimtsoim ve'inyonim. From there, from that spiritual realm, it extends and spreads forth, and whatever essence, whatever is encoded in that spiritual reality, then manifests here, Things that are appropriate to be rooted in the spiritual world and things that are appropriate to show up in this world, whatever Hashem decides. And Hashem is what generates the power of this chain of energy originating in the spiritual world, drawing forth through this chain. And Hashem, so to speak, prints a reality, a version of reality on each level, one stage to the next, until it's all tied down into the physical world down here. So therefore, down here in the physical world, you can trace anything back up that chain to the original spiritual forces that generated all of it. And everything that exists on all of those levels remains at its station, at its level, defined in its own way, as the Creator has instilled in its nature. And it does not change. There are not, you cannot transcend one level of reality. To the next. Things exist where they are and they stay there. And these roots exert influence of energy 
onto their branches, so to speak. All according to that chain of energy that has been established for them. And all of this is not supernatural. This is exactly natural. This is the way Hashem intended the world to work. Mm. So all of that should not be new information. That's just a recap of things that we've done before. Number two, the Amnam. However, Hashem also decreed that there be a nature embedded in these forces that affect the physical world, that they have the ability to affect the physical world in a way that is not, so to speak, normal. Meaning, these forces can affect the physical world according to their own laws, the laws of these forces, and not according to the laws which are appropriate for that physical thing. Hmm. And therefore, because it is, so to speak, unnatural for these physical things, when these forces do act on physicality, it will change the laws of nature. Not permanently, but it will change the way physicality will operate beyond its normal functions. Help me understand this, because we have a, a chain of events that comes down from the spiritual plane that then yields results, basically, in the physical plane. Yes. Uh, so what is this saying that's that's different from that? It sounds like it's saying there's something outside of that chain, but it's still it's in the spiritual realm. Mm. It's not outside of the chain. It's part of the chain. It's just that when you get to the lowest level, right before the physical world, whatever acts on the physical world to make things happen. Mm. When I pick up a cup, my hand moves, it grasps the cup, it creates friction, it pushes the cup up. All of these things operate according to the laws of nature, and they seem to be all physical. But in truth, as we've just explained, mm -hmm. these really all are rooted in spiritual laws right. that just manifest and project into physicality. So that lower level spirituality, which directly affects the physical world, they also have properties that if you use them properly, if you know how to use them and access them, they can also affect the physical world in a non-standard way. I see. Okay. Man was given the ability to use these forces in that way. Just like man has the ability to operate within the physical world, like we said, pick up a cup and operate within the laws of nature, man was also given the ability to operate these spiritual forces that act on nature in a non-standard way. Now let's explain a little bit more what that means. Now, just like when I'm operating within the physical world, even though I do have the ability to act on the physical world, it's not unlimited according to my own desire. I can't pick up a 3,000-pound object mm -hmm. just because I want to, and I can't teleport things with my mind. There are rules that govern how I'm able to interact with the physical world based on the rules of the physical world itself. And he gives some examples here. The physical world can only be used in very specific ways according to their laws. You can't cut something without a knife mm -hmm. or something sharp. You can't ascend without a ladder or steps, and you can't depress something that isn't soft. The same is true in the spiritual world. There are laws for how I can interact with it. So it's talking about just if you leave the physical manipulation of matter and go into this new type that he's talking about, you're just jumping from one set of rules to another. Yes. 
what he what he's really getting at here is that although it's possible to supersede the laws of physical nature those are also in very specific ways and those have laws as well mm -hmm. this is not the the path to infinite power exactly if you have the ability to perform supernatural acts by hacking the system diving into the code and changing it before it gets to the physical world it's not just an access to unlimited magic mm. there are specific ways you can redirect energies and all of it is according to what Hashem decreed would be appropriate because of course this is not exploiting a flaw in the system there are no flaws in the system that Hashem made it's all perfect and therefore if the ability to access these things is here it was intended to be here by Hashem for very specific reasons mm -hmm. number three a further principle that we're going to discuss we've also already explained the fact that man is a fusion of these two entities these two opposite entities the body and the soul the very pure spiritual entity called the neshama is it's tied into the body according to the laws that it's tied to according to the way Hashem decreed that it should be tied into the body. And it turns out that now man is very confined in his state of physicality, his bodily state. According to the laws of his body and the rules of how physicality work. And the neshama, the spiritual entity, which should be immensely powerful, is tied with ropes to the body. It cannot escape. However, Hashem wanted Hashem wanted man to be able to, at least to some degree, to some small degree, open up that ability just a little bit, and to detach very slightly from those bodily chains and give more access to the neshama. And man will reach a state which is less physical and more spiritual. And as a result of that, he will be able to grasp things understand truths that are only accessible on that higher spiritual level and could not be fathomed while the soul is fully attached to the body. The soul is concealed from these things in its state of being attached to the body. And with this line, he explains why Hashem wanted this. There could be situations where a person is more capable of bringing the world to its ultimate perfection, which of course is the goal of creation in the first place. It could be that certain individuals will have a reason to override physicality to a certain degree, to reach higher levels of spirituality and detach from their body a little bit more, and manipulate things on a more spiritual level in order to accomplish the goal that was that was going to be my question was is this portion talking about the actual the venturing outside of the physicality as far as you know manipulating the physical world it sounds like he's just talking about elevating and identifying more with your with your soul it didn't sound like he he mentioned anything about um what, what we're talking about is, I mean, it sounds like magic. Right. He, he did. I'm not sure exactly what you meant, but it sounds like it's something in between those two options that you gave. He is talking about an elevation, but it's not just that he is feeling more spiritual or identifying more with his soul. There is something that's happening that is 
there's a metaphysical change in his makeup where he is more access to spirituality because his soul has become a little bit more detached from the body, allowing him to accomplish things that would be otherwise impossible. So that would give him access to quote unquote magic, which is not a great word. We're going to explain a little bit more what, what he's really doing. Right. I'm, I'm still working through some of the vocabulary for this stuff. Uh, so this enlightened perspective, it's not just an enlightened perspective that makes him better able to uh, perform our mission, which is effectively to, to fix the broken world. It's more that he's actually going to be able to do things that he could not otherwise do. Correct. There's a fundamental change in his makeup. Okay. Number four. Vehine, heichino achachme elyoino, shiyamatze bitul ligvulim migvulei hateva hachaymer vehaolam hazeh. Hashem prepared a way that there will be an ability to nullify some of the laws of nature, to bring down the barriers that define the physical world. Specifically, the kinds of barriers that lock a person into the world of physicality and block us off from higher elements of spirituality, for example, interacting with spiritual entities like angels or others. Hmm. And man is then untied from the knot that is tethering him to this world. And he becomes established on a higher level in a state of more spirituality to the point where he can develop real connections with spiritual entities. Even while he's still here in this very obscure body, the physical body. Ve'ulam, however, not all of the laws of nature can be nullified. Just some of them. Only the ones that would be appropriate for this intention. This intention that's guiding the world toward its perfection. Like we have mentioned back in section one. The gam ele betanaim mishay arim udrachim yaduim betachlis adiktuk. And also this method of removing barriers to the spiritual world that also, of course, has many conditions that are very measured. It's all precise. Number five. Vaulam hiskina chachmas is barach shemay em tsaim la adam. Now Hashem created in the world means for man to be able to accomplish this. That using these means, man is able to accomplish this goal of being able to break down the barriers between physicality and spirituality. If he wants, and he knows how to use them properly. And we're talking about nullifying these boundaries that define the world. And he can establish himself on that level, breaking past his normal barriers, like we've mentioned. And all of this depends on what we're about to explain right now. Da. Know the following. We have already explained that everything that exists on a general level and on a specific level, is all Hashem manifesting His will. So it comes out that everything in existence and all of the orders of things, whether we're talking about the source powers up in the heavens, or we're talking about spiritual entities like angels, or anything in the physical world, they only exist in so much that Hashem is providing them with the energy of existence. 
Hu nimtzo u mesgale al kol nimtzov. And therefore Hashem is manifesting in all of these things. U mashpia bom kefi masha roi lehem lekium inyonam. And is influencing his energy into all of these things in order to establish them and give them their existence. Venimtzu hashpos rabos vashainos kefi ribu hamakablam vashinom. And therefore, the influence itself that Hashem is exerting is going to be different for everything that is accepting it on its different level. Meaning, if Hashem creates a certain kind of angel, that energy is going to look different than the way a frog shows up in this world. Right? And that should be obvious. And the difference in these energies that are being exerted is what defines how things are different when they come into creation. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. What he's getting at is we take for granted that there are different things that exist and that they have some sort of inherent existence. But it's not true, meaning the fact that a watch exists and a frog exists and the concept of the number three exists, all of these things only exist because if you trace it back to their ultimate source of existence, it's an influence of Hashem's energy. And therefore, the difference in anything in existence can be traced back to a difference in the type of energy that's being exerted by Hashem. A different input from Hashem. Exactly. That's all this is. And when those, like you said, different inputs from Hashem are drawn forth, that is what generates everything that shows up. And the entire chain of existence that comes into being. According to what Hashem has arranged. And the angels, the Malachim, receive this light, this influence from Hashem as it's being revealed to them. So this energy, this input that is very specific gets handed down through this chain from one angel to the next being passed down through all of these levels until it shows up at the bottom of the chain. The Amnam. Now, Ratzo Hashem Yisbarach Shemai Liyos Nikra B'Shem Now, Hashem wanted to be called by name, which is interesting because Hashem really shouldn't have a name. People speak about gender. Well, how could there be a gender for God? We're not going to get into that now. But the truth is, how could there even be a name for God? Right. A name defines the essence of something, at least in the ancient Hebrew it does. How can you have a definition of something without any boundaries? Precisely. You can't. Nevertheless, Hashem wanted to be related to. Hashem wants... The point of our entire existence is for us to be able to relate to Hashem and recognize Hashem and bring the world back to Him in unity. And therefore, we have to be able to recognize some sort of concept of Hashem, even though it might not be ever exactly true Hmm. because we cannot conceive of the infinite, but there needs to be some method of us being able to relate to Hashem. And therefore, he has created names for himself for us to be able to relate to. Now, he has specified one name in particular that's very special, and that is the Yud and He and Vav and He. And he said in the Torah, this is my name forever. And it's the highest, most lofty name that a man could conceive of in terms of the way we could relate to Hashem. And this is the, the name of glory, the holiest name. And But again, this is not a definition of Hashem, of course. 
This is just the way he wanted us to relate to him. Ve'amnam, furthermore. Kefi ko prate hashba oisav. Ratza v'nikr v'shem v'shaynim. All of, this is where it gets relevant. All of these inputs that we've been talking about, anything that exists in this world, any function that's being performed, and any action that's happening, and anything that comes into existence, it's all a result of some input from Hashem, some very specific type of energy that's being condensed into this world. Hmm. Hashem also wanted all of these inputs to be called by names as well. I'm starting to see where this is coming together. Vihine, gozar v'chokak shibahazkir b'ruav es shamo, yemashich lehem imenu ha'ar v'hashba. Hashem built into the world a very special power that in the mentioning of a name, of his name, it will draw forth that energy, that inspiration of light, that influence that is associated with that name. The Torah says in Shemos, in the book of Exodus, in any place that you mention my name, I will come and bless you. So this must be at least part of why we're so careful with the use of the names of Hashem. Yes, absolutely. Yes. But I just want to look at that verse one more time. He says, in any, t- in any place that you mention my name, I will come and bless you. And it could be understood, and I think it is understood on the, on the simplest level. If you just read the Torah, it sounds like if you call out to Hashem, He'll respond to you, He'll come and bless you. But what the Ramchal is telling us here is that there's a deep secret that's embedded in that verse. What he's saying is, if you mention my name, I will come and bless you consequently. It is the mentioning of the name which draws forth that energy. It's not just wow. the fact that you're calling out to Hashem. It's the fact that you verbally pronounce the name that draws forth that divine energy to open up blessing into the world. Ve'ulam, kefi Hashem she'yazkiruhu v'yikruhu bo, kach t'yeh hashbo hanimshechas al-yedeh hazkarahi. Now, of course, according to the name that is mentioned, that will be whatever energy and input is associated with that name will be drawn forth. Perush, ki hashba shetimashech t'yeh mimin oisa hashba sh'alasoido nisyasid lo yizbarach shemoy hashemahu. Meaning what we've just said, that whatever divine energy or function which is going to be performed, whatever name is associated with that in its ultimate foundation is what is going to occur at the mentioning of that name. V'omnam, v'himashich ha'ashba, t'ivolid b'hechreya chatoilod amuchekaslo. So at the mentioning of that name, as a direct result of that, consequently, that result will occur. V'yispashi to'inin b'chol ha'ishtar shalus min ha'roish v'ad soif k'moshik osavnu. And that energy will spread throughout the entire chain from the very top until the end, like we've written earlier. Now, Hashem defined this power, this ability to invoke these names and create change in the physical world. These are defined by very specific rules and with very specific conditions. And it's only under those conditions and following those rules will this have any sort of effect whatsoever. Um, you know, if I'm ever quiet sometimes, it's because I'm, I'm waiting for the next sentence so often now. Because, yeah, that what we learned just kind of, it it requires, it begs the question, why, why wouldn't I invoke Hashem's various names in in all these different things I'm doing. And of course, Ram Khal foresaw that question and answered it right there. He it ha- just wouldn't work. <laughs> right. Well, that's half the answer. Half the answer is it wouldn't work because you don't know how to do it right. But the other half is even if you would know how to do it right, you still shouldn't. And the answer to why would you not do that, he'll answer later on okay. in this episode. Vihine. Bichlal hashpoz shegozar shiemashchu mimeni yisbarach shemai. Now, included in these energies that you could invoke, Now, 
מגבול הסתבע כמו שביארנו. Now, embedded in these invocations, with, together with that energy that's being drawn forth, it also comes together with an added ability to remove those barriers of physicality and nullify the definitions of the physical world like we were mentioning earlier. So this is the, this is the mechanics of how it works. A person invokes a certain name. Now, and it's not just magic. What that name does is it, it literally calls a function. Mm. You are calling a function. You are... I, I don't know if you want to be using all these coding terms. <laughs> if, if you know, you know. <laughs> that through the pronunciation of that word, which is itself... Now, I, here's where it's not exactly like calling a function in programming. It's not a code that is meant to then generate something. It is the function, hmm. right? Because this is what we were talking about. The, the name of something is the essence of what it is. And all of these energies that exist in the world have names. And what that really means is that the name is the essence of that function. So when someone pronounces that name, they are doing the function. Now, they don't have the power to do it directly, but what they are doing is drawing forth that function itself from the higher realms. Is this connected, this is a little bit of a tangent, but is this connected to the, the, the beginning of Bereshit where Adam Harishon names all the animals and I, I ostensibly probably names all the things in existence? Well, he names the animals. Be, it, it's connected at least in the sense that we see that the, the concept of a name is the definition of the essence of the thing and that he saw the animals and understood their true essence. And he, he didn't arbitrarily name them, but he understood what their names inherently were hmm. and spoke them. I see. So this is something different. Here he's invoking, a person is invoking some function of Hashem's energy by calling out its name. And that also, what he's saying now, has the ability to, in addition to that energy itself, it has the ability to override the normal laws of nature. And to tie that person to spiritual things, right? This opens up the channels of his spirituality. It detaches himself a little bit from his body. And it gives him access to this divine knowledge that would have been otherwise inaccessible. And not just that, he has access to other things. He doesn't elaborate. And this is also what Ruach HaKodesh, or divine inspiration, as it's sometimes translated, or Nevua, which is prophecy, it's all related to this as well, but those are for a later chapter. Vihine Gazar Shaham Shachas Hashbo is Ha'ela. Now he decreed that the drawing forth of these energies, Gam Kain Tiya Al Yedehaim Saisha Zacharnu, these energies that break down these barriers between physicality and spirituality. It's also done with the same means. Meaning, calling out the names of Hashem that are related to that energy. These names that a person could even just think internally, hmm. or that he verbally pronounces it with his mouth, or he's connecting them together with other words. With all the conditions that are required for combining names together. Like we'll explain further in the book later on. So again, he's not giving a guide to how to do this. This sounds, if it sounds complicated, it's because it is. And he's not giving instructions for how to do it. But again, we're just understanding the general concept. Number six, the Hine Hadavar Yadua. Now, along those same lines, he says it should be known. 
even though the general principle of everything we've been discussing is this one idea, the concept of breaking the laws of nature. There are very numerous details to this. All according to the structure of reality and all of the different levels involved. Because just like within nature, within reality and all the levels of existence, it is very complicated and there are all these different levels. And therefore, corresponding to that, there are just as many different kinds of energies that are required to bringing these to fruition. So therefore, if a person wants to invoke one of these energies, it just makes everything that much more complicated. All of the conditions that are required for doing it properly become more and more complex. How will a person be able to identify that frog among everything in all of existence? It can't be as simple as there's one name for this frog and you just pronounce it. Now, and even within, even if a person could identify one of them, there are varying degrees of how far you could take it, of how far you can break those laws of nature. Just like anything else that has details upon details. You could have one person that exits the laws of nature to X degree, and someone else who is able to accomplish that same thing, but a little bit further. And we'll speak about this also later on. This is fascinating because there are, are def- I'm an avid reader and there are definitely a ton of, you know, fantasy series and things. I mean, things that I read a lot before many years ago. I just have vague recollections of all sorts of magical systems being based on knowing the true names of a thing. Uh, there's, there's something to it that, that I think speaks to everyone. There is something to it. I think it's, it's something that is deeply embedded within human knowledge. Uh, th- this was known by Adam, right, and, and known by early cultures as well. The f- even the phrase abracadabra is Aramaic which means I will create as I speak. Hmm. Abra, I will create. Kidabra, as speech. <laughs> wow. So th- this is nothing new. Yes, and, and these, this uh, concept is deeply embedded in many world cultures. Now, because this chapter is very long and deep, we're going to cut it here. We'll split the episode, and next time we'll come back with a continuation of this chapter. All right. Thank you, Rabbi.